How big of an influence do you think it had? I mean, like, in other words, if your parents weren't into music and they it wasn't in your house growing up, do you think it would have just taken you longer? Or do you think you maybe wouldn't have even found this intense love? I that's I feel like that's an almost impossible question. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> like, I was just thinking I'm glad I'm asking and not answering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to a brand new episode of Inner Sleeve, the podcast taking a behind the scenes look at all things music. I'm Cassius Morris, Joe Pacheco on the line joining me. Joe, what's up? Same old, same old. We're going to be talking weather. It's beautiful these last couple of days in uh, in Montreal, so we have to talk about it. <laughs> Can't complain about that. And actually, unlike last week, this seems to be an eventful week in music, so it seems like there's a lot to talk about. We have a loaded show today with Long Range Hustle as our guests, who we're about to introduce and chat about in a moment. But real quick before we jump in, just a quick reminder that if you enjoy what you're seeing on the show, please subscribe to the podcast version on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or radio. We also have the video podcast up on YouTube, so make sure to check in with us on all of those platforms and hit that subscribe. Also, a quick reminder that we have our merchandise up for sale, which you can find in the link in the description of this episode. T-shirts, hoodies, crewnecks, I mean, anything you can imagine, and all this merch is super, super comfortable. You have hats as well, right, Joe? Yep, caps, pillowcases, phone cases, the works. And send us a photo of you rocking this merchandise for us to post it on our social media at SoundMojo. This past weekend marked the 64th annual Grammy Awards in the world of music. And this was a little bit different for the Grammys. I think it's fair to say all the way around, Joe, right? I mean, new location, some issues with viewership. Everything feels different, I guess, post-pandemic, right? So everybody's got like, uh, and and post-pandemic, and I would say post-Will Smith slap, everything just feels different. It really yeah. does feel like a fever dream still. I mean, it, it, it was a little bit of a different vibe, though, for the Grammys because it took place in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand. I don't know about you, but I thought it was kind of cool to have the Las Vegas vibe for the Grammys. I thought it sort of gave more of a party atmosphere to the to the environment. Yeah, it seemed to be also a little bit more open. I got the vibe that yeah. it felt a little bit more spacious and open. I mean, but like, did you, uh, obviously you watched, I think. You watched it, right? I did. I, I, I saw most of it. Yeah, I had a family engagement, so I couldn't be there to sit down and watch it, but I I caught some clips and stuff. But I mean, you know, if you wanted to tackle, like that's viewership seems to be a hard, uh, hard topic for them right now. It's a very hard topic. And I think this seems to be a common theme for all these different award shows. I mean, the Sunday Grammy Awards, they missed, they just missed an all time low in the Grammy ratings. Now, they were just eclipsed by the 2020 Grammys, which I guess didn't, no, sorry, 2021, because 2020 yeah. was canceled and 2021 was sort of yeah. virtual, correct? Yeah, that's it. So that one had the lowest viewership, I guess, since 88, since they've been recording wow. it, like the, the viewership numbers. And this one just, just passed about like 130,000 so viewers, you know? And it's it's surprising, right? Because like I mean, you know, we were talking about this off camera, where it's like when I grew up, it's like you you watch, you knew the Oscars, you knew the Grammys were on, and yeah. the majority of people watch it. But I think honestly, it's the splintering of the audience at this point because like there's so many more options, right? There's Netflix, YouTube, there's uh, Twitch, there's all these other platforms that the Grammys aren't on for the most part in terms of the live broadcast. So like it's that's really splintering their audience. It's so true. And I mean, to go and sign up to Paramount Plus, they were saying, go sign up now quick before the show starts. I'm thinking people aren't going to run to their computer, get out their credit card to sign up for a trial that they know is going to charge them in a month and a half when they forget. So it's like the whole model is sort of broken. Now, Now, let me throw a wild card question in here. Do you think that it would be better for the Grammys at this point to just bite the bullet, run a ton of ads, but just play this on YouTube as one of the options? I guess so, because like we were also saying, like, if you're not like for the younger generation, like my kids don't have an I uh, they don't even know what the Grammys are or even the Oscars for that part. Right. Because it's not wow. it, it doesn't it's not part of their you know, they don't sit down and watch TV. You know, they watch YouTube, they'll play something, you know. So, yeah, they got to figure out something, man, to capture the younger audience. It's true. For me personally, it was always my family was into the Grammys because they were excited about it. And that sort of made me aware of it and the Oscars and all that as a young kid. But you're right. I mean, if the parents aren't excited, if the you know people my age aren't excited, how can we expect the kids to keep going? So, I mean, well, do you think the Grammys are going to last? 
Yeah, I think so, because like it's yeah, it's just it's gonna be maybe a different, different version of it. But I mean like they did they trying, you know, they they did partner with Roblox to help generate interest, which is a smart thing to really? do, you know. So you wanna like you have to go where the audience is, right? Like everybody used to flock to LA, New York, or certain cities because that's where the industry is. Today everything is very splintered and online, so you can you don't necessarily have to go to LA to make it, right? You know, you can start doing a lot of other things. But yeah, they're going to have to figure out like how to reach the audience better. Now, jumping into some of the winners of the Grammy Awards this year, there was a lot of wins in the pop category. That seemed to be, I mean, and, and very common names and reoccurring names as well. The most common names I'm seeing on this list are Doja Cat and Olivia Rodrigo, who, I mean, they seem to both be having some pretty intense breakout years in the business. I don't know if you've been following it but i know you said that doja cat's been following you every time yeah, you get in the car i was just, just going to say that every time i'm in the car it's either dua lipa dojo doja cat and like uh, obviously olivia rodrigo you know and i'm not in the car often so it's like and if i know them then it's like yeah because they're they're out there you know ed sheeran and all, and all that stuff right silk sonic was cool that there's such a cool project that like between uh, bruno mars and them so cool yeah they got um, the record of the year for leave the door open the album of the year was john batiste who and i, I don't want to sound like some sort of music snob i gotta be honest i yeah. wasn't familiar with before same this here. same year same uh, same with you yeah not from well you know i'll be honest like I'm getting on in my years, and it's like a lot of these names. Obviously, I know uh, most of them, to be honest, but I mean, like, I did not know um, John Baptiste. Now, this seems to be a common theme with the Grammys, and, and I think one of the big criticisms that people like Eminem have had, The Weeknd had, who have boycotted the Grammys, is that they seem to invite all these big names and nominate them for awards like this, and then they seem to give it to somebody who they're looking to push in the future. Does this, am I crazy, or does that hmm. seem to happen? Yeah, now that you mentioned it, I never really thought of it that way. But yeah, because you want to draw the crowd, right, with these names and these people. And like, obviously, they're going to be, if they're nominated, it's because they're they're at a certain level. I'm sure, you know, there's yeah. criteria to get there. But I mean, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good point. Like the Oscars too sometimes, right? Like the movie that won is like, everybody says, I never even heard of that movie or I never even saw that movie. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a common thing. Now, one of the shocking categories, and I think this was sort of, I'm not sure how long they've been having this category, but they threw Louis C.K. in for Best Comedy Album, and he won. So this was something that, I mean, do you, now, this sort of goes back to the common theme. Can we separate the artist from the art, which we've tackled before? Where do you stand on this one, Joe? I, I guess for me, it depends on the crime or the severity or what it may be, right? Like, uh, I'm not sure. Like, Louis C.K. was a fan before. I haven't seen much because I think he's sort of been canceled. Uh, and so I haven't seen much or kept up with his stuff. Yeah, it's cool to see other comics in there, too. I mean, Chelsea Handler nominated, uh, Lavelle Crawford, Kevin Hart. Best rap album went to Tyler, the creator for Call Me If You Get Lost. I don't know if you've checked him out at all, Joe, but this is a guy who he's been relevant for like 11 years now, and I've never given him a chance until this year. I'm becoming a fan, I got to say. Uh, yeah, all cards on the table. I've heard of that name for a long time, but I haven't really checked it out. Pretty cool. For me, it's uh, I'm a fan of the production more so than the actual raps. Um, best rap song went to Kanye West featuring Jay-Z for Jail. Oh, yeah. Which I find kind of hilarious, Joe, because not only was Kanye banned from this year's Grammys, but he's also urinated on a Grammy in a publicity stunt and still continued to win them. That's democracy, I guess, right? Freedom, <laughs> of, freedom of pee, not freedom of speech, I freedom guess. Freedom of you know? peas, yeah, exactly, <laughs> but there you go. But like in the sense that like, you know, I mean, it's it's about the work, right? So they maybe they, you know, they do separate the artist from the art. Uh, as we say here in French, coup de car or like a thing was like when I saw Dream Theater winning uh, yes. um, the for battle, uh, best battle, <laughs> best metal performance, you know? And Huge. like the reason why I like that or like, you know, I'm happy about it is because I've been following this band since I was a kid, literally like, uh, and it's like, like John Petrucci when he walked up and he said like, this is a band that like the song that won is in 17, eight time signature. So it's not like a tap your foot on, uh, tap your foot to the beat kind of song. It's way out there. It's prog metal, you know? And, uh, but it's, for me, it's like, they've had, a, they've had all the success you could want that band in the sense of like doing what they do they didn't change for yeah. anybody they were you know labels i'm sure everybody's told them you know change your sound your songs are too long this and that uh, you know and so they sell out their tours for the last 20 something years you know global tours 
doing what they want to do, you know? So that, that makes me proud. That just shows me that like, it's not often, it's like a unicorn technically in the industry, you know, yeah. type of, those type of uh, success stories. But I mean, they're there and they're possible. It's incredible to see. And I mean, the Foo Fighters cleaning up as always too in the rock category. Um, now, did you catch the Taylor Hawkins tribute? No, did not. It was pretty touching, I got to say. I mean, it was it was a good, I think, two minutes long, and they showed some really nice videos of him. Um, they didn't spend much time on anybody else for the memorials, and they did miss Joey Jordison, and well, they missed a couple other people in rock, right? Yeah, they missed a few people. Like, people took to Twitter right away, blah, 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 complaining, but they were listed. They just weren't mentioned in the actual uh, okay. mem memoriam thing, which, like anything, I had a conversation the same night of the Grammys when I saw Dream Theater won. Uh, they would have, you know, and have to do like a one minute or 30 second uh, display on every person that passed away, uh, sadly. I mean, and like in even every acceptance speech, right? So Dream Theater isn't on the main show, right? They're on the, right. they're on another sort of, or early pre, pre Grammys show. I mean, the show would be 10, 12 hours long, you know? So it's like, yeah. Eventually they have to cut somewhere. So it's sad that let's say like Joey Jordison, a lot of the fans were probably expecting him to see him there, but it just hit me right now. Like I've known like growing up, like, you know, Metallica played the Grammys. That was a big thing. Right. You know? So it's yeah. like, it's like, and a lot of people, you know, and it's true to an extent, I'm sure there's a lot of other genres, but like, I mean, metal has always sort of been like, uh, not like, like kept away sort of thing, you know, from, from yep. winning or, or even performances. Maybe they were afraid, like, you know, some of the metal people would scare the people at home away and that, then they would lose their viewership back then, you know? Sort of a counterculture. Because you don't have, you never see, like, Pat Metheny is like one of the biggest jazz artists of all time, you know, and he wins every year. He's won like 20. He's been mm. nominated like 40 or 38 times or something wow. that I checked. But you've never actually seen him on the prime time. You know, classical music, same thing. You know, you'll never see anybody except for classical on the prime time, you know? Now, without question, the biggest win from the Grammys came for the world of video games. And Nintendo cleaned up in a revolutionary new sweep now, Kirby, that's right, the video game character Kirby has officially become the only Nintendo character in history to win a Grammy Award. Now, this is, this is, this just made my day. Well, technically, obviously, it's not Kirby. The Kirby's the <laughs> it's actually a, a big band. Let uh, me have this, Joe. Just let me yes, have this yes. one. <laughs> of 30 to 60 uh, members, you know, they're called the 8-Bit Big Band. And they uh, do the soundtrack of all these, you know, Nintendo games and they tour. And that's what's always been amazing. Like Final Fantasy orchestras, they tour playing Final Fantasy music. So cool. Know? It'd be interesting. Like, it's true. Now that you we were speaking about this, like why it's like the, it's only the third game. I, I put it here. This marks the second occasion a video game has won a Grammy. Wow. You know, and like when you think about it. Like, you know, all the big games, Red Dead Redemption with these, like, like Daniel Lanois and all these major artists and, and composers composing these things. I mean, they should be uh, a, a little more prominent. It shouldn't be, like, after 30-something years, like, now it's only two Grammys that have been won by video games. So uh, maybe it's the beginning of uh, what's to come, right? This battle entice kids because kids play a lot yeah. of video games, right? That's a great point. And, I mean, maybe they could even have best video game performance. I mean, they had Travis Scott and Ariana in Fortnite. Maybe they could give a Grammy. for. I mean, maybe not a Grammy, but something. That's true. Yeah, good point. Yeah, there was a concert. 12 million people watching those those concerts, those events on Fortnite. And Roblox also hosts a lot of these type of concerts. So, yeah, maybe that's uh, where we're headed. Now we're going to jump into the interview portion of today's show. We're very happy to be joined by the guys from Long Range Hustle, an awesome, unique group. And without further ado, let's hop into it. We're back with some more tremendous guests right here on Inner Sleeve. We're here with two tremendous guests from Long Range Hustle. It's a pleasure to be joined by Paul and Jay. Gentlemen, what's going on? Not much. Just uh, pleased to be here with you guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having Likewise. us. Likewise. Likewise. Yeah, no doubt. I like the setups there. So we got some Beatles and some guitar in the background. So that's <laughs> uh, some pretty telltale signs. Now, what type of photo was that there, Jay, in the back? This is, I think the Beatles are hanging out outside of the BBC. Nice. I get that. 
Did they ever take an uncool photo? I don't <laughs> yeah. think it happened. Yeah. Even <laughs> off guard was on guard for I mean, them. Yeah, I'm sure like a horrible photo would still be like, they're so cool. Yeah, uh, I think MI6 probably, you know, took down all the bad photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Predator, so, you know. Like, even no that, doubt. That, that Get Back documentary, like, they look so cool in that at all times. Oh, did weird. they ever? They looked and sounded amazing. I know. You know what I mean? like, like, even as... We've we've had we've covered that that uh, documentary on 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 the channel, but it's like still still reeling from it, man. Just like the audio quality and like even they're just they're jamming, you know. They just sounded so good. Yeah, it was just it was effortless for them at that point. It's pretty crazy. No doubt, just flowing out. And Paul, what about the guitars there? What do we got behind you? And we got the mic, this little studio. Wait, can I can I take a guess? Can I take a yeah, guess? Right. Let's, okay, let's the hear white it, one over there. I think is a Gretsch because. Yep. Of the F holes okay. and the Bigsby, right? Then you have a, is that a Telly? Yeah, Fen, a Fender Telly, two it's, humbuckers. Uh, telly, Telly thin line, so it's a, a hollow body. Oh, that, yeah, that's cool, man. Just killer. A solid body electric guitar. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted like a thin line one at the hollow body uh, Tellys. They're 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 wicked, man. Mm -hmm. That's Paul's signature weapon right there. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the Telly is my go to, uh, and then I've got uh, a baritone. Uh, Hagstrom um, mm. and uh, uh, hidden behind the mic is my sort of main acoustic guitar, which is a uh, Taylor. Mm. Man, I love broke, that. Broke the I mean, bank on that one, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor's. Oh my God. Yeah. Back, back before uh, Rosewood was a, a tough thing to come by. That's true. Yeah. No doubt. I mean, it's how many guitars you actually have? Is this the whole collection or are there others sort um, of hidden? There's a, there's a couple others kicking around but uh you know these are the the nicest looking ones <laughs> <laughs> that's cool you gotta gotta have them on display so i mean maybe let's let's go back i mean where did this whole journey start for you guys you guys are from sort of small town ontario maybe set the scene in sort of the beginning of uh, long range hustle i mean i think the, the beginning probably goes back to us playing at high school coffee houses uh you know okay jay and i would our, our high school had like a really fantastic um coffee house community and it was every time that uh one would get announced you'd have to rush down to the office to get your name mm. on it because everyone would be signing up uh which was a, a fantastic like high school music community to sort of come up in mm. uh and so we would just always get up and, and start playing and, and after a year or two we were like you know we should probably you know play together for these <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was always like, I Give think it a shot, a, and then that's kind of how it happened. Yeah, it's a, like a mutual admiration, I think, in, in high school and watching each other play and um, and then realizing like we had really similar um, like musical tendencies or or things that we liked or things that we gravitated towards in music. So um, this sort of started there. And then uh, Paul, Paul actually had started a band started the band long range hustle without me first <laughs> okay but then uh we, we started jamming together and he was like oh i, I want to get this guy in my band and um on my 18th birthday i think i think that was yeah my 18th birthday paul had like given me tickets to a hip show or, and we went to this hip show like the next weekend or something like that and uh we had been jamming a little bit and then we we were on the ride home just riding the that high of a, a hip show. It was their first show of the K Rock Center in Kingston. That's dating us. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, <Been> yeah, there. <laughs> it was the first show there, and uh, it was just electric. And I think driving home, we were like, "Let's do this. Let's make a band. Let's do what they just did." I want. I want to know what that's like. So, like many other Canadian bands, I think the. We we were mostly we were inspired a lot by Gord and, and Tragically Hip. So yeah, I don't think you could be Canadian and in music and just not like <laughs> exactly. at least have heard of them or you know you might not be your thing. Which I like them, you know, but like uh, they were legendary. I mean, I think it is part of the citizenship test now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, so when you guys first got together and started creating did you hit it off right away or, or was it like how how long was that sort of initial phase of getting to know each other creatively uh i mean i, I would say we hit it off pretty quickly just you know because we did have that kind of mutual admiration from seeing each other play and um we were sort of already friends in high school so it was a pretty quick thing to just go <laughs> like we should get together and start 
start jamming. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that was a, a pretty quick spark that after we left high school, um, cause I, I, I don't think that's a, a particularly unique, uh, thing to have happen is, is you meet up with some friends when you're, uh, a teenager, when everything feels super, super exciting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's after we left high school that I think, um, we started putting in a lot more work <laughs> because yeah. you know, as teenagers, uh, you think you're super good. And then, uh, you, you go into the real world and you're like, Oh, actually we're not that good. <laughs> we yeah. should put more work into this. <laughs> that uh, teenage really, confidence. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, and I think, um, you know, we started playing a little bit more through undergrad and realizing, okay, we're gonna have to put a lot more work into this. Uh, we recorded an entire, uh, full length record when we were, I think, 19. Uh, wow. and it's not very good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't show it to anyone. Um, but, uh, it was sort of that, that era of being like, you know what, we do really click and we're going to stick it out and, and put the time in to become better than we were as teenagers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually achieve what we thought we were achieving in high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, that makes a lot of sense, though, because, you know, it, it can never be super smooth when you're first starting something. And I mean, you know, and, and I always wonder this with guys who sort of were friendly before they started being creative together. Like, is it hard for you guys to give each other criticism or to say, hey, maybe this part isn't up to snuff for our song or whatever? Or was that easier because you guys were familiar? That's kind of that's interesting. Like, I think Paul and I have always been just really supportive and uh, not super critical of each other. I think that the, the the point where we got a lot more serious like paul was sort of alluding to when we started wanting to make this a, a more of a career and and to get really good at it i think that's when we started preparing for town which came out in 2019 i think or 2018 i can't remember now jesus um, 2019 i believe 2019 yeah so we it's uh fine. That was really the point where we had someone's, we had a third party producer, uh, Tony Dugan come in and sort of start to slap us around a little bit and be like, Hey, like mm. this isn't real music. You can't do like, this is how, this is not how songs work. And I think we were always very much like, let's, let's try to be ourselves and be really unique. So instead of it being like sort of critical, it was always like, that sounds cool. Let's try and see if that makes sense in a song, you know? Um, and then once we started working with the producer, that, that was the point where we're, yeah. I think we're a lot more critical of each other in a positive way now where we're like, we, we, I think we understand songwriting a lot more and, and, and arrangement and, you know, how to, I mean, I, I think, I think we, in the writing process that those, like the critiques are generally leaning into the things that we're really excited about as opposed to I, I, in those early phases of songwriting, we're not super um, into going like, ah, you know what, like that is, that's a mess. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think what we tend to do is, is build on like, oh, that thing you just did there, that's really good. We like, mm. let's lean into that and do more of that. And um, we will just sort of layer up the things that we're excited about. Mm. Uh, and then sometimes you end up with like too many layers and you need uh, you mm. need a producer to go like, all right, there's a lot of good stuff here. You got to pick, you know, half, <laughs> of, half of the ideas uh, before we can actually make a make a proper record. Mm. Uh, but I, I think that is is a big part of our process is really like hyping each other up about the things that we think are working. That what's good, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned Tony Dugan, right? Like uh, you've worked with him now twice on this last record as well. How did you end up meeting him? We, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like actually pretty nuts. Like we we uh, we were massive massive fans of uh, of Winter Sleep and the album Welcome to the Night Sky um, when we were in first year university, like coming out of high school and sort of really getting serious or serious or getting really obsessed with you know making and creating music. Uh, for Long Range Hustle. That was like a, an album we both connected to heavily. Another one was Seeds by Hey Rosetta. And we always would scour liner notes. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we started seeing like, oh, there's uh, Tony Dugan produced that. I wonder who that guy is. And then we started looking at his resume and he's worked with like Balance Sebastian and Snow Patrol. And like he's, he's Mogwai. Yeah, Mogwai. Like it's insane. So then we saw that like seeds came out a couple years later, I think 
anyways and and we noticed he had produced that one too and we're like all right like this, this <laughs> is I mean, our guy this is our guy undisputed undisputed yeah. he's been welcome to the night sky i think for both of us would be like in our top five records of all time and okay. so I, I think especially after seeds came out and we were like wait the same guy produced mm -hmm. this yeah. <laughs> so Can't be we just cold called him and mm -hmm. sent him a demo and we uh in in advance of town we had like self-produced seedlings to saplings um and you know that was that was good but we wanted to take it to another level and we we're like we should we should bring in uh, a grizzled veteran <laughs> that's <laughs> that it really help us take this this record to the next level and so we picked a, a bunch of people and tony was at the top of the list um but you know we probably had five or six people we were like it would be amazing to work with these and we messaged all of them and one by one they all came back and were like hey look i just like don't think this is a good fit um you mm. know keep keep doing your thing but like i'm this isn't for me uh and so you know we were starting to get very discouraged <laughs> as i can as imagine yeah names are getting crossed off off this list and literally the the last person to message us back was tony who's the top person on our list and he goes like i'm into this and we're like okay that makes sense because like the stuff that you produced was such a big influence on us yeah that I'm, I'm sure he looked mm. at, at some of those songs and went like okay this is i know where these guys are coming from yeah yeah he kind of connected yeah. with us because we are our sound is informed by bands he's already worked with right so yeah hmm. that's it that yeah, must have been so kind of surreal though oh yeah it was. I, I was literally jumping up and down when we got like a uh, a message back from him. Yeah, and it wasn't no right away. It was like, whoa, he's gonna have a Zoom call with us. We're gonna talk to Tony <laughs> Dugan. <laughs> awesome. That's cool because like it's inspiring for other people listening to us uh, to uh, to this and saying like, yeah, man, reach out. You never know, man. Like it. that that one chance. You know, it's like everybody had to say no, and then this guy said yeah. It's like that's the one you wanted all along. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. super cool. Uh, did, back in like the first uh, time you worked with him, was it virtually as well? No, no, no. The, when we did Town, he flew to Canada, and so we, the the Hip Studio, the Bathhouse, um, you you live there while you record. I mean, you don't have to, but you can, you can, and why why wouldn't? It's kind you? of the goal, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, chained up, you can't leave. It's great. No. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, we moved in there for a month, and he came and stayed with us while we made the record, and it was a very intensive, reclusive space um, that that we just burned through making the record with him, and it's a very intimate setting to get to know someone, mm. uh, and so we we went from him being this very sort of like an abstract concept of a record producer <laughs> to a, a guy that we were effectively living with for a month um and very quickly you go from sort of reconciling the the sort of idolized version in your head with the, the real person uh and tony, i mean i love absolutely love tony but he's a he's a gruff guy like he he will tell you if something is not working and he doesn't uh doesn't you know beat around the bush so that was that was a very right. like crazy learning experience for us to get to jump into that and be like oh no <laughs> like is everything <laughs> going okay he just yeah. told me everything i'm doing is shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like people say don't meet your heroes right like yeah. sometimes yeah. but in this case it worked out yeah uh, i mean it's great like i think I, he's he's the quintessential scott like he's he's uh he is abrupt and he's brash and he's just like he will tell you exactly how he feels about something and not sugarcoat it which you know is is like at first a little startling and you're like uh oh like because we're, we're we're canadian and we're super polite and we're like that's it yeah. you, know, you wouldn't you you know we, it's not how we talk to each other but once you sort of get used to it i i, I actually really appreciate it because you, you're not trying to read between lines and he's he's when he says something is like, is, you know, all right, you're like, sweet, like, I got it. Mm. He's like, that's, it's all right. That's a thing. You're like, all right, cool. Yeah. Uh, that works out. <laughs> you know, like, realize after a second that e even though he's giving you the critique, you're still pulling towards the same thing. Like you, you both want mm. to make the best record you can. Mm. And you you sort of make that mental shift of like this isn't a personal critique this is we are trying to make a record and you know me as the record producer i'm telling you like 
this is not how we're going to make this better. We need to do a different thing. And that's, what's going to make this better. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be able to separate yourself personally almost from the situation because the end goal is to have a kick-ass record you know uh see uh, from going from working with him on the first time you, like you're living with him and then now to working remotely vi uh, virtually obviously we prefer togetherness right but like how did it work with uh, virtually how did you guys end up working with him i mean i don't think we could have done it if we hadn't have spent that like month living yeah. together making the first record um it was a very bizarre scenario uh, for for the bathhouse it was the first time they'd ever done any kind of remote recording um and so we had to mm. in advance like change some stuff about the bathhouse like setup wow. so that they could even do what we were hoping to do and and i think now a lot of recording studios are um have switched to to be able to do that very easily but at the time which was a lot earlier in the pandemic they, they're going i don't know we just uh, we are not set up for this kind of yeah. thing. Uh, like we have a webcam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's... We, they literally had to get like a new internet service because we were like, oh, that's not going to be enough bandwidth for us to like both be running uh, Zoom like all day and Audio Movers, which is a program where you can basically yeah. send your, your outboard to virtually to someone else so that they can hmm. manipulate it from there or at least be like getting the board mix straight from the board. Um, so yeah, it's between those two things. It was just like, yeah, we can't use the, uh, the backwoods dial up internet. We got <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. The, the studio is not like in Toronto. It, yeah. it is pretty, pretty, uh, rural. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean the, the actual process of, of recording, uh, you know, Tony would be in his studio in Glasgow and you know, connected via audio movers to the bathhouse and we'd have his face on a little iPad that you could move around <laughs> from room to room, you know? So if he was like, oh, I'm, you know, take me over to Jay, I want to tell him something. <laughs> uh, and so he would, you know, he would stay with us for a good chunk of the day. But, I mean, we were really in a position where we could have opted to just wait and not record the record and none of us were of that mindset we were like we were ready to make this record let's find a way to do it and one of the things that sort of worked in our favor was the time difference um because okay. we sort of we ended up with a good eight hours probably working simultaneously but then he would be able to say all right I, it is you know midnight one in the morning in glasgow at this point here's your to-do list of things that you can guys can go do without me and mm. you know do it this way or do something surprising that like i wouldn't tell you to do um because you guys will be on your own and then in the morning while you guys are, you know it's four in the morning here we're still asleep he gets up and is has a chance to like review all of that stuff that we did without him right uh, and it made for this sort of odd asynchronous collaboration where where we got to sort of experiment a little bit he would take that in the morning and craft it into something and then we'd meet up again uh when we got up so it was it was a really cool uh thing that is not how you would normally work in a in an in-person setting i'm just curious with like the audio mover stuff like um like you're tracking at the bathhouse and he's hearing it there pretty much almost real time right Hmm. Yeah, and is is it MP3 or is it like wave like or the quality wise? No, like wave, like full studio. Okay, twenty four yeah. bit even like yeah. that's a lot of bandwidth. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. curious. <laughs> yeah, because like I mean, I mean, like like if you're tracking drums, you have to send like what twelve mics, you know, twelve channels all the way it's, down. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a huge amount of data. Uh, yeah. Dang. So it's, yeah. That's cool because yeah. like then it's like he has to tell the engineer, all right, you know, move the mic a little bit here, move the mic there. Oh my god! I mean, I, I've worked in studio forever, but I mean, like, I've never worked remotely like that. So it's, or, it's interesting. Tony is Tony is a very um, like he he's a producer, but he spent a lot of time as an engineer. And I think you know there there are some record producers that are more like songwriting background, and and he has like this really strong. Uh, studio engineering background. So, you know, mm -hmm. when he's micing up drums, yeah, like, like you said, he's, he's moving a mic an inch here, an inch there. And when, when we were working together, he would set all that stuff up himself. Mm -hmm. And now yeah. he was really working with Niles, the, the bathhouse engineer 
who is, is a brilliantly talented engineer himself. Yeah. Uh, and again, the fact that they had worked together previously, mm -hmm. um, Tony would be like listening via, you know, remotely and Niles is sort of adjusting knobs that Tony can't wow. see. And they're trying to sort of like trust that, that's that it. they can nail the stuff down without actually being there together. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I'm sure like uh, when you're not used to it, especially like you said, it was at the beginning of the yeah. pandemic. So everything is like uncharted waters, you know? Yeah, it was, uh, it was really bizarre, like the, the whole process. But like Paul said, I, I really don't think we could have done it unless we had been together for a month previously, like going through the whole process before um, for town because yeah. yeah, I know like Tony would is Tony implicitly would trust Niles and trusts us and knows our tendencies and knows what, like what we will do and what our limits are. And so it's easy, it's it's hard to do that if you've never met the person like you can't really gauge uh, someone's body language through, you know, yeah. Zoom or anything. So it's just yeah, that rapport had to be there for sure. And and we ended up, you know, because we were the first people doing that, we ended up to, you know, as guinea pigs in a way and since yeah and especially shortly after we've had a, a number of like colleagues or other bands say hey we're interested in doing this remote recording thing we heard you guys sort of broke ground a little bit on that. ahead of the curve <laughs> yeah can you tell us like you know what works what doesn't work so it's been kind of fun to pass some of that uh you know hard-earned knowledge uh, <laughs> yeah. to <other> people <laughs> i wanted to give props to ryan yeah because he's he is like a tech wizard and he's the guy who dealt with like setting all of that up. And we're saying like, oh yeah, it was hard, but he actually, <laughs> like, he was like <laughs> losing his mind daily in the studio. Like it was so ridiculous <laughs> trying to keep that thing running. I wanted to ask you guys, we have both of you guys here, but you also have three other members, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got Ryan, uh, who is our lead guitar player. I mean, absolutely brilliant guitar player. Um, but also is uh, like a studio producer and engineer himself. So he's he's always a fantastic resource to have. Um, we've got uh, my brother, Mike, on bass. Uh, and so, I mean, we've been playing together forever and, and he jumps in on, on harmonies uh, in this sort of like family band style. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we've got um, AJ, our drummer, who again, like fantastic drummer, but bringing also some like videography and cinematography expertise because he's doing uh, most of our, our music videos and, and a lot of our like cool social media like videos that he cuts together. So um, it's really it's really nice to have like a, a group of guys that is very talented uh, in in a very multi-dimensional kind of way. It never gets easier. get into the videos which i wanted to ask about uh i was curious because we mentioned harmonies and that's the first thing that you know as soon as i heard you guys singing i'm like wow i love lush big harmonies that you guys do you know and i was wondering well, like how did that come about because like i know i i guarantee like listening to the album i'm like okay these guys can literally just play in front of me acoustically and i'm not going to feel like i'm missing much you know what i mean like whereas mm -hmm. you would be like if it was like an acoustic performance you'd be like ah but i'm missing the drums and this but like i know what the harmonies is like you're taken care of so like how did you guys get into this five part i don't know if it's a five part i don't know if everybody sings there, yeah i mean there are uh there are five, five part harmonies on on the record on the new record for sure but i think like it's uh it's funny you say like if you just played this acoustic in front of me like I wouldn't be missing much. That's sort of been our ethos in songwriting since the start. Like every song starts with Paul and I, or not just Paul and I, but it starts acoustically. And um, we will, we try and stay true to the song that way. And I think like that's sort of our goal to make sure that if you played the song acoustically, it wouldn't be much different. But with the, with the harmonies, I think for one, singing, singing harmonies is like, one of the best feelings ever. I don't know <laughs> how else to explain it. That Just, dopamine like, boost, man. Yeah, it's incredible. Like, it's amazing. And I think we both grew up loving, like, 
uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, like Grateful Dead, like uh, our parents were very much like very hippie type people. So through the 70s, they were listening to folk music that had tons of lush harmonies. And um, it's always just been uh, it's just it's just part of who we are as musicians at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, we I, I even our like earliest stuff when we, you know, back in high school was was stacking up big harmonies. I think I think that's right. one of the first things we really connected on yeah. uh, and certainly for for Mike and I growing up uh, and Jay I know that this is like the case for you like music was something that you did as a family uh, and you would you know get around a campfire or in the living room and people would would break out a guitar or the, you know you've got the upright piano uh, and and people would just sing together and I think that uh, feeling is something that we've always tried to incorporate into our own music is that even if in the, in the studio, you build everything up with like lots of electric guitars and massive drums and cool synthesizers <laughs> that if you strip it all away, you still have like a family sitting and singing together in the living room. Yeah. I love Amen. that. Wow. I mean, like back in the day, man, like People, like there was an organ in every house or a piano or instruments in every house, man. Like everybody sang, you know, everybody played like stuff. I find like now you don't, it's rare you see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were very lucky growing up to have parents that loved music in such a deep way and, and played and sang music. Um, it, it's like it informs really early what your tastes are and and, and, uh, and your passion for, for the art itself. So, yeah, I'm super lucky. How big of an influence do you think it had? I mean, like, in other words, if your parents weren't into music and they, it wasn't in your house growing up, do you think it would have just taken you longer? Or do you think you maybe wouldn't have even found this intense love? I, that's, I feel like that's an almost impossible question. Yeah, man. it is. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was just thinking, I'm glad I'm asking and not answering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's yeah, true I mean, though. I, it, it, at least to, to my mind, like my musical uh, I don't know, aptitude and, and musical taste is so intrinsically tied to those roots that I can't imagine not having those sort of early life musical experiences and still ending up doing the kinds of things that I've done. Mm -hmm. hmm. I, I think there's something to like, you know, there's, there is uh, something to be said about, you know, your, your parents sort of influencing your, your tastes and your, and like igniting those passions in you. But I, there is an innate like attraction to creating and performing live that I think if that was still a part of who I am, I eventually would maybe lead in that direction, but not in the same way. Right. I think like yeah. the, the passion is fed by your parents and, and the people you surround yourself with. So I think that's, that's like really, you know, I, it's not like I probably would still be playing music and be obsessed with, a band it might not be winter sleep or hey rosetta or whatever but you know it would be i'd be obsessed with something that's for sure some form of it right yeah yeah i think i think so. i'd like to think so but <laughs> we'll never I, know i think having like coming from a musical family you treat music as as sort of like a given rather than a yeah. thing that you know um uh you know i have friends that are fantastic musicians and but don't come from musical families and so for them it was like a hobby or a, like a, a, a you would take lessons yeah study oh so right like you would treat you know hockey or something that you sort of did outside the house and I think if you come from a musical family you treat it a little more like it's just sort of a natural part of what you do on the day to day because it's in your house all the time yeah. No, that's a phenomenal point. Um, here at Watch Mojo, obviously, we're well known for our top 10 lists. And I wanted to sort of give you guys a little pop quiz on one of these here. But first, I wanted to get you guys' take on the top three that should be listed here. This is for the top 10 Canadian musical artists. And I'm curious to know who you individually think the top three should be. Oh, Man. <laughs> and this Ooh, is like spanning one. it's not like it's spanning all time almost you know all time? yeah well not all time but you know what i mean like within the last 50 or 60 years yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and joe you can give a couple if you guys need to kill like a couple seconds to think of it but if you got it let's hear it uh i would in my top three neil young would have to 
be near the top, you know, maybe sure. my number one uh, Canadian artist of all time. Um, I mean, if, if this is just like a personal, yeah. art, like a personal yeah, yeah. thing, then, uh, then, then for me, the hip is like my number yeah, one. Yeah, it's got oh. those two for sure top three. If we're going to, yeah, those would be in my top three as well. Um, okay. Joni Mitchell is like a, is a classic. Uh, man, Rush. Rush. Hey, I was I was gonna say Rush. Like Gotta growing Rush up more in, in the more in the eighties, I would, for me it would be like I know, off the top of my head comes Brian Adams, Rush. Yeah, uh, and I can't think of a third one. Who would be a third one? Probably, yeah, probably the hit. The weekend. The weekend, dude. Mm, Good call. I mean, why? <laughs> I, I, I'm not like hugely influenced by the weekend because we're just too old for that to be like yeah. a massive influence, I think. I'm but, dating myself now. Yeah. <laughs> In a good way. But yeah, I, there you go. I, I think um, I would not be surprised if like 10 years from now, the, you know, the weekend is sort of right up there with people like the hip or Neil Young in terms of yeah. like, oh, Drake. Like, massive influence. Yeah, yeah. 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 No Bieber, doubt. for sure. Yeah, Bieber, definitely have to give him credit, man. Yeah, you do. We once saw Justin Bieber busking in Stratford on a high school trip. Uh, yeah. And- really? Yeah, before he like really blew up. It was so funny, man. I, I remember I remember it vividly because I was like, who is this like 12 year old, just <laughs> the cutest kid of all time. I don't know if you remember <laughs> pictures of him from when he was young. Oh but, yeah. Like, oh my God, dude. He had the Bieber hair at the time. It was really like, I remember, we were walking out and every girl on the bus was like, Oh my God, look at that kid. He's so cute. <laughs> and, uh, they're all like, you know, 15, 16 years old. And I remember like seeing that. And then like a year later, I started seeing like a couple of videos online of him busking in the same spot we'd seen him. And they had like 2 million views. I was like, wait a second. That, I remember, <laughs> yeah. Remember that kid. And then like, a year later, it was just like worldwide biggest thing on earth. And we were like, oh my God. Man, I had a similar experience way back. I was watching Incubus. I don't know if you guys knew the band Incubus back yeah. in the day. And I'm dating myself early, like maybe 2000 or 2001. And I remember outside coming out of the venue and it was uh, this girl handing out CDs, you know, like, you know, handing out her album and stuff. And then I, so I see her name and I'm like, ah, oh, Portuguese. I'm like, ah, oh, Fortado. I go, I know that. You know, I go, yeah. come, my parents come from this place. And then she's like, oh, me too, my parents. Two weeks later, don't I turn on like MTV or something and I see fly like a bird. I'm thinking, that's the girl I just spoke to. <laughs> that's <laughs> nuts, man. She's handing out CDs. And then like a few weeks later, she's everywhere. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. So I feel cool. so inadequate with my stories right now. I got no, no, nobody I met before they were famous. So you never you met the weekend when he was like working yeah. at Subway or something. When his hair was 10 times bigger. No, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> So I can tell you guys the top three that we have here on our list. Um, so number three for the, the top 10 Canadian musical artists was Celine Dion. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, at least, at least worth mentioning. Uh, cool. Number two, we had Rush. So I don't know how you guys feel. I like Rush personally. Not my favorite, but I, like, I enjoy I that for sure. I was big into Russian in high school for sure. Yeah. Everybody. It's a high school. It's a very high school band. <laughs> yeah, it's a very high school band. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. And then at number one, we have some good guesses here. We had Neil Young, which I think is it's hard to argue. Yeah, guy's a legend. He's the man. to go back uh, speak about like uh, election night the video uh it's a very nice video like obviously shot I, it was a shot and edited by your your drummer right yeah yeah yeah. Uh, he the shooting he worked with um jack holly who's a, a director cinematographer so they sort of co-directed um the the shoot and then uh aj did all the editing and like post production and, and all of that stuff and who came yeah. up with like the concept of it you know uh that was us yeah uh, yeah, it was between, it was sort of like the song itself has a, is like a story. It has a narrative. And, and I think the, the video is trying to essentially mirror that, that narrative uh, to match the, the lyrical content and the story told in, in the song itself. Uh, 
Um, we we got together with AJ um, a little bit, and he he was getting into sort of script writing a little bit, um, and and so we sort of were marking out a, a plot line as almost like a spec script for the for the video, and and really working through like brainstorming different ideas for the like flashback sequence and you know mapping out the the flow of what happens in the actual sort of election hall uh and so that was like a, a really interesting experience uh to start from like a blank page and, and build out the the video from scratch i know like i was like watching it listening to it and it's like you know the music has like a really uplifting kind of vibe right but the story is pretty sad obviously right <laughs> and it's like so i'm listening to this i'm like man this reminds me of like the only other artist i can think that does this type of stuff is like death cab for cutie i don't yeah. know if you've ever listened to him oh, so it's like yeah. he's got these crazy thought-provoking lyrics which you guys do as well and it's like oh but yet like am i sad or should i be happy <laughs> you know, like, i'm not right. sure <laughs> i mean death, death cab was another big like i think both of us were mm. huge into death cab in high school uh oh, yeah. 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 Undergrad. um but uh yeah, yeah it, it is like it's a a bit of like a heart-wrenching sort of bittersweet ending <laughs> to the to the video yeah. and to yeah. the song itself mm. Is that a challenge, though, to sort of decide, like, which way do, I, do we want to go with this? Do we want to make it more uplifting or do we want to make it maybe a little more heavy handed sometimes? Because there's a time and a place for both, but it must maybe be hard to decide. I don't know. I don't even know if those are as conscious decisions. Um, I, I think lyrically, we sort of just zone in on, on whatever story or emotion like we're feeling from a writing standpoint. But as a as we sort of build the arrangement of the song a lot of that is the five of us in a room together doing what feels right uh and so i think when we first started playing election night i don't think i had in my head that it was going to be that massive of an ending <laughs> until yeah. we got into right. the room and and uh and aj started hitting just this massive drum beat and jay put together this insane synth patch that just is so overwhelming uh mm -hmm. it's like a wall of sound and we're like wow this is so intense we this is just the direction we're going in now yeah it's not it we don't really i don't think there's a point where we go is this is this too too emotional um i think like paul said it, it just it's just trying to serve the the concept um and it, it ends up being like a lot of our stuff is very introspective and um, tr delving into basically trying to uh, articulate hard to articulate feelings, trying to express <laughs> itself. Like it's like, yeah, you know, and uh, the music doesn't always it's it's we're never like, oh, it's a sad song. So the music has to be sad. It just ends up being what it is. Yeah, I actually think oddly enough, I, we have occasionally done that and it doesn't work necessarily because because when you mentioned that it made me think of this the sort mm. of earlier uh jam sessions we did for american cash and yeah. at the time like when when the two of us had started working on that song in the living room and um i was getting super into into phoebe bridgers at the time and was like this should be sort of like a phoebe bridgers style like <laughs> chill low-key mildly angsty <laughs> song right and, and so we we got into a room with the whole band and started working on that and i was like all right so like this is the this is the feeling this is what we should do and we started doing it and you know it was fine but it sort of the longer we played it, the more everyone was like, but I kind of want to kick it up a notch. And I think yeah, uh, that is has often, you know, if we try too hard to make something one way, uh, it doesn't end up going in that direction. <laughs> yeah, you just have, try hard, you die you, hard. You know, you have to read the room a little bit and go like, oh, everyone's like, we should rock out right now so like yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone's feeling like we should do something else yeah. so we should just do something else yeah follow that maybe <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. a lot of songs just dictate how they should go themselves you know like mm -hmm. they just write themselves almost you know mm -hmm. no doubt so i mean I, obviously you guys have the new record that that just came out 
Um, I am alive, but only if you say I am. So, I mean, what's what, what's next in terms of plans for the group? Playing shows, I think. Yeah, we're, that's it. Yeah, we're coming back, and we're starting to we're starting to fill up our, our schedules here. So, um, yeah, it's been like a long, long haul. Like normally, we would have already toured a lot of these this these songs. It would have been out, you know, six months ago, and we would have been onto something else. And, and we still haven't really toured the record. I mean, we we played our album release show at Lee's Palace in Toronto, and it was like I mean, what, such, what a night that was. It was like one of the best. Nice shows and like nights ever really i've ever had it was awesome so it was like very, very cool i was gonna say it's, it was a very cathartic experience to not only like release the record but sort of feel like you're back <laughs> yeah right yeah um so now we're we're we get, we booked a we're going to a festival in in um in wisconsin called mile of music in this in, in the summer and we're starting to fill in uh, some American dates in, uh, in Ontario and Quebec. And down to uh, New York in April. Yeah, nice. New York and Killer. Syracuse and Detroit. So we're like, we're starting to fill in the schedule and, and hopefully we just keep building uh, momentum back um, and we can just keep the train moving. But, I mean, I think ever... at the end of the day, we are sort of fundamentally a live band. Uh, I think we hmm. love being in the studio and it's a super creative, interesting space. Um, but going all the way back to sort of that that core, like where the roots are, we started playing because we liked, you know, jamming at coffee houses and playing in bars and music clubs and festivals. And so getting back to that, which I think is like our core competency is is being in a room with people and, and really like having that uh, sweaty live feeling where everyone leaves and goes like oh wow like i i am buzzing right now that's yeah. that's our yeah. that's our bread and butter I, th I think as musicians we're spoiled in in many ways you know it's like from just creating something out of nothing is already magic in itself but then the moment of like playing live and getting that energy back is again you get it's like it's just it, no i don't think i feel sad for people who don't get that experience who will never get that experience yeah, mm -hmm. yeah i've just been basically just chasing that feeling since i was 15 years <laughs> old you know <laughs> like that is uh and trying to make it bigger and and ha trying to make it you know a, a, a crazier show a, a show where people have to walk away like wow that was amazing like i want i want people to walk away from our shows the same way we walk away from like our favorite band's show you know where yeah where it's like floating for a couple like a of high hours. on a high exactly i think when you when you go see an amazing concert uh at least for for me and i think anyone who sort of is a musician would feel this way is, is you walk away and you feel like i need to get an instrument in my hands right yeah, yeah. And just i am so energized by that uh and it is it is like a very a real privilege to be on the other like the the mission yeah. end of that to, to be like all right everyone, <laughs> go out back into the world and and feel energized and go do what you're gonna go do yeah i i actually saw tame impala last night they were at the scotia bank place oh my killer God. what a shot it's like the first arena show i've been to since the pandemic and it was packed and like the, we like the crowd had held on to their tickets for two years it was supposed to happen wow you know, two years ago and so like it was just a crazy vibe and i i literally like throughout the show was like i keep we're, we're touring the world like we're gonna yeah I, we're gonna be i we need lasers stat like <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Been no there, doubt. done that, bought a shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's killer, man. Sounds like, sounds like a great time. Well, well, I mean, it's really been a pleasure to chat with you guys, Paul and Jay, and Long Range Hustle. Everybody make sure to check them out. We got the links in the description below, especially the brand new record, so do not miss it. I want to give a huge thank you to the guys from Long Range Hustle for stopping by Inner Sleeve today. You know, these guys are awesome, Joe. And 
really cool to see them really having an appreciation for the Canadian scene as well as different scenes around the world. Yeah, like the fact that they're Canadian kids and, uh, you know, born in uh, a little more, not less necessarily Toronto. I think they're Toronto based now, but they were born in the Ontario uh, region. Yeah. And Rural. yeah, it's, and like, you know, I love the fact that they grew up playing as a family, right? Which led to all those awesome harmonies and those type of folky kind of like uh, songs and structures and stuff. So it, it, I like that part of, uh, of their upbringing. One thing I found very interesting is like, it seems to be like the last few artists we've had or will have on the show have all had like coffee house sort of startup hmm. experience. Yes, that's true. You know, and interesting like these, coincidence. Yeah. And these guys, like they had their high school thing where it was like a, an event, you know, and like, and everybody wanted to be, you have to sign up and rush to get into it. And that's kind of what sparked the whole long range hustle, uh, getting together. And, uh, that was nice to see. Like I, I, I listened to the album a couple of times and like, I, like I was saying in the interview, like those vocal harmonies always catch me. They have this yeah. crazy, like, ability where it's like the lyrics are profound and like really make you think thought provoking but yeah. the music just seems so airy and uplifting so it's a bit like wow what's happening am i ha should i be happy should i be sad you know so that, i love that, that though it makes you think you know like it's good to have a song that makes you feel something specific but a song that can make you ask a question i think is, is equally good yeah and it was so cool to hear like um you know in the middle of the pandemic like oh we still have to do this album right they got to work with their favorite producer and stuff and i was love the story of of like, don't give up, you know, just because like, you know, one person says, no, it didn't fit. It's not a fit for me and you guys working together. And they ended up working with their all time favorite producer. So it's like, it was meant Insane. to be. Insane. The you last know? guy they asked, which is, yeah, which is amazing it. too. And it was great <laughs> to see like that, like, you know, cause like they've worked with him on one album together and then like, now you have to work completely apart, you know? And like in a time where we can do that, right. They can have full audio mixes and like the guy could be telling you, Okay, move the mic a little bit to the left and you can hear it right away, yeah. you know? Like, that's that's fantastic. And the effort man. it took to set that up, I mean, it was insane what, what they had to, to go through. And, I mean, it's cool that they also adapted the other spot, like the actual studio spot, to do this because it was new for everybody, you know? So it's cool to see people, like, just grabbing the situation, whether it's a quarantine, lockdown, pandemic. They're like, we're going to create some new stuff and, and revolutionize our game, you know? That's it, you know? Like, when, like you know, I always say mothers the... Uh, necessity is the mother of invention right so when you have mm. when you need something you just make it happen you know and luckily we're in a time where you can do that you know remotely across the ocean you know, across the atlantic you know you can have like your producer over there and like at the end the end result is like there's no suffering like the listener will just listen to it as if it was done normally you know it's the best and we appreciate the guys from long range hustle for stopping in and we appreciate you guys for checking us out right here on inner sleeve new podcasts every single week subscribe to the youtube platform sound mojo for new uploads every single day and our social media at sound mojo for on this day in music and updates about everything else we're doing you can check out our merchandise in the description of this episode and make sure to check out the podcast version on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher radio we're available on audio as well for your mobile commutes thanks so much for checking in with us and we'll catch you guys next week